Chapter 15 Whispers in the Darkness Psst, Pinkie Pie, are you asleep yet? Rest. Sleep came in fits and starts. I seriously, desperately needed rest, but every time I closed my eyes, fevered dreams of wasteland horrors dashed themselves against my mind's eye. I saw ponies loading into a passenger Sky Bandit Stages wagon. In my mind, they were families on their way to a day of laughter and fun at the Ministry of Morale Amusement Park. Parents smiling warmly as their colts and fillies pranced in place with anticipation. I don't know why, but I was certain that MOM had built amusement parks and that they had been regularly packed full of screaming kids. I saw mothers urging their colts not to climb on the seats, fathers checking to make sure their cameras had film, and a great wall of green flame with a sinister rainbow sheen rushing towards them that somehow no pony could see. I saw a pony named Trixie leaving a message on the door to her cottage, grinning as she assured herself that her whole life was about to change. I saw her walking away from that door, which in the dream I had somehow become, even as I called out to her to come back, knowing that if she left, she would never live to see her little cottage again. I called, pleaded, cried, but she could not hear me and walked away. I saw ponies giving their loved ones the great news that they had been selected for a stable. I watched as they, bright and colorful living ponies, trotted into their new home the clock on the wall above them counting down the minutes until an accident would doom them all to horror and death. I, I awoke with a fit. I was laying somewhere, a bed, but every time I tried to remember exactly where I was or how I got there, the memories slipped away. I opened my eyes. The room was dark, but light poured in through a cracked open door. I didn't recognize the walls with their shadowed posters or the roof with its still and silent turn. My body felt wrong. I ached. I felt horribly weak. I had chills when I wasn't sweating profusely. My stomach churned. My mouth tasted strange and mushy. Shadows trotted near the door. I heard Calamity's voice. Do you think she went and picked something up in the stable? Velvet Remedy's voice, soft and clear, responded, Or it could be brought on by stress. I'm worried about her. I think the wasteland is getting to her. Y'all seem to be doing quite well, Calamity observed his voice low as so not to wake me. Velvet gave a wry, yet very feminine laugh. <laughs> not as well as you think, my noble outsider. Was that sarcasm? Or affection? I, I couldn't tell. I'm trying to think about it made my thoughts swim. And I should do better than Little Pip. I'm over a decade more mature than she is. Great. I'm a child to her. Beautiful. I'm a fucking filly. Same filly as the first time we met at some older filly's cutesiniera. My life just couldn't get any better. And all those drugs she's been taking, mm, they're certainly not helping. My stomach convulsed violently. I wanted to cry. My eyelids were too heavy to look around anymore, and I didn't fight them as they closed on their own. I turned away from the slice of light coming through the door, falling again into fitful sleep. Are you going to stay in here with her all night? Calamity's voice was a whisper very close to my bed. I wasn't entirely sure that I was awake, much less at which point the tides of dreaming had deposited me on the shores of awareness. I vaguely recall the change in the darkness, a fluctuation of light, perhaps opening of a door. 
at least until the fever breaks. The whisper of Velvet Remedy's voice sounded from near my head. My ears twitched. She wake? She's been in and out. She'll sleep better once the fever's broken. Wonderful. My body felt alien to me. My mind was a horrible, shifting haze. I said a silent prayer to Celestia, begging her to take my sickness from me and cast it to the moon. I'm more worried about you, Calamity said, and not just because you need your sleep, too. Celestia, why do you hate me? My sickness and misery was giving them time to bond. My mind started tormenting me with images of how they might be spending their time together now that I was effectively out of the picture. Oh? My fevered brain insisted that she sounded pleased as well as oddly condescending. Your shield spell ain't anywhere near as strong as them. Calamity paused. Alicorns, I guess we're calling them now. Was that disgust in Calamity's voice? No. Not disgust, but something else. Something unpleasant, as if the word didn't taste good. Your point? If you're going to be making a habit of using your body to shield other ponies, you need to start wearing armor, Calamity insisted. <laughs> Yay, Calamity. I was going to tell her that too, just never quite had the chance. Mm, my head was feeling heavy. Just listening seemed to take effort. My body was too hot, the blanket drenched in sweat, but my limbs were too heavy to move. Sleep was creeping up on me like a manticore ready to pounce, wanting to drag me off into nightmares again. Won't get me into anything worn by one of those nasty raiders, Velvet was saying. I realized I'd missed part of the conversation. Wouldn't want you to. Slave or armor neither. Bad idea. <laughs> Ask Little Pip when she's up and about. Calamity whispered firmly. But when we get to Ten Pony, we're going to buy you some proper duds for the equestrian wasteland. My despondency evaporated at those words. A strange sense of relief, twisted by illness, washed over me. Part of me, I realized, had been afraid that they would leave me. I felt doomed to wander until either I found my place in this hellish outside or or I fixed it, at least as much as I could. I supposed I was searching for my virtue, as Watcher had suggested, like a filly trying to invoke her cutie mark. But Calamity and Velvet Remedy were not burdened by my quest or my sense of being utterly lost. Why wouldn't they lead me to it on my own once they found some place to stay? At Ten Pony Tower, for instance, why shouldn't they? To hear them speaking of getting Velvet Remedy armor, something I firmly agreed with Calamity that she needed, even though I couldn't picture my elegant idol wearing anything other than classy dresses, to know they were planning for a future wandering the equestrian wasteland, presumably with me, filled my heart with assurance and hope. But, despite the warmth of these feelings, as I drifted back to sleep, my mind began to venture again down dark paths. I found myself wondering what, if anything, could have been done to save all the ponies of Stable 29. With exposure to the surface fatal and their water talisman dying, all I could see was hundreds of ponies trapped in a sarcophagus under the ground, already buried, waiting to die. They did not, my mind insisted, need to die with such violence and horror. But the only way I could think of to save even one of them... No, that would have been too abhorrent to consider. The only way to save even one would have been to make sure the strain on the water talisman was so minimal that its deterioration would have taken several decades. Something that could have only been done if, initially, in, instead of reducing the population by that minimal... 0.02%. I cringed away from myself, revolted that I could even think such a thing. 
I awoke again hours later with a silent gasp, drenched and chilled with a cold that sank into my soul. My sense of what I'd been dreaming collapsed into a dark pit that was swiftly sealed by wakefulness. Only a few shreds of memory remained. I was fairly certain it had something to do with the Ponyville Library, dead cats, and being burned alive by a dragon. I found a canteen had been hung by the side of the bed. I drank greedily from it and then fell back into the horrors of sleep. No! Don't go! I'm trapped! I cried out, my hind legs crushed under a fallen wall, but Velvet Remedy and Calamity just walked away. Please! Don't leave me here! Velvet Remedy leaned her head against Calamity's mane and nuzzled. The ground was stretching between us. They were barely walking, but they were getting further away. The clouds were boiling down, becoming fog, surrounding and obscuring them as my heart threatened to seize. I knew that when they disappeared, I would die. I awoke, crying, and beat a hoof against my pillow. Despair tainted my hope like a cupcake with ashes mixed into the batter. They were staying with me, but I was losing them to each other. My ears perked. There were no voices. Oh, Luna, I was alone. They'd left me. I, I still felt trapped. My head jerked up, looking around frantically. Gray daylight seeping between the heavy curtains. Were they armored mesh? raised the ambient illumination in the room. Something heavy pressed against my side. Turning, I found Velvet Remedy asleep, her head having fallen onto the bed beside me, pinning me under the blankets. Relief was like a flood of painkiller, numbing the irrational fears of my night terrors, which clung to me like leeches. I was happy for Velvet and Calamity. No, really, I was. I was just lonely. Lonely and mm, frustrated. I looked away from Velvet and found myself staring at a huge wall poster, garishly pink, advertising the Philadelphia Fun Amusement Park. Everything the Grand Galloping Gala should have been, endorses Pinkie Pie. Every day, forever. Uh -huh. Now I knew where that notion had come. On the opposite wall was another copy of the recruitment poster. You too can be a steel ranger. I realized where I must be. Lifting my pit buck, I checked the auto map. <laughs> steel hoof shack. I collapsed back onto the bed, feeling unbearably exhausted, physically and mentally. And even worse, I felt horny, which was not a sensation that mixed well with illness. Maybe it was having Velvet Remedy so close, her head pressing against my flank as she slept partially on my bed. My stomach twisted in warning. <laughs> I didn't care. I was too hot, too sick, but still... As I lay back, I tried to summon up daydreams that would relieve at least one of my symptoms, my hooves beneath my blankets. I turned to face away from Velvet Remedy in shame. I contemplated Candy, but her face and features were already faded in my mind, and the ending of my relationship with New Appaloosa would sour any fantasy. I considered the rainbow-maned mare from the memory orb, but... No matter how well she'd aged, she was still older than I wanted to fantasize about. And even if I pictured her younger, the link between her and Calamity would just make it weird. Finally, I settled on daydreaming about the mare from one of my statuettes, the breathtakingly alluring white unicorn pony with her dreamy purple mane and tail. I enjoyed that as much as my sickness-addled body would allow, for maybe half an hour. Then, like a splash of cold water, 
I realized the mare I was fantasizing about was Velvet Remedy's great, great something or other grand aunt. <sighs> that murdered my fantasy and danced cruelly on its corpse. The weight of Velvet Remedy's head was suddenly more present than before. I could feel the warmth radiating from her, and my stomach nodded with guilt. Suddenly, I felt the heaving inside me and the taste of bile. Pushing to the edge of the bed, I vomited into the crevasse between the bed and the wall. <laughs> Still retching. My mouth foul and burning, <laughs> my eyes shedding tears. I hear Velvet Remedy stir awake. <laughs> my fail was complete. Now, instead of being a child in her eyes, I'd be Vomit Pony. I had no chance of stealing her away from Calamity now. <laughs> not that I ever did, or ever would. I'm not that kind of jealous, selfish pony, but just saying... If I was that kind of pony, this would be the final nail in the coffin of any chance I had. I felt Velvet's weight lift from the bed as she pulled back from me. Oh, little bit, are you okay? What a stupid question. Yet, I nodded, my head pressed against the wall. Let me get you some water. I waited for her to go, crying just a little against the wall, my coat matted in sweat, my head burning against the wall. God, it's so pathetic. Velvet Remedy returned to give me water, to clean the wall and floor of my vomit, to bathe me and replace the sheets on my bed. I was in no state to enjoy any of it but I could properly marvel that she took the time on some pony like me. My fever finally broke sometime that evening, and I finally slipped into a restorative, dreamless sleep. I awoke feeling like I hadn't felt in days. Sane. My body was weak, but not feeble, and I was warm and thankfully rested. My mouth tasted pasty, Ugh. but my stomach was settled, and I found I was quite thirsty. I rolled over in the bed, wondering how long I'd been half delirious and Spotted Velvet Remedy curled up on the floor, fast asleep. My heart went out to her, recognizing how much I owed the older unicorn. Her head rested on an old jacket, and some pony had pulled a blanket over her while she slept. I was sure it was Calamity, and I was pleased. As I floated the canteen from the bedpost, the deep, resonating voice of steel hooves carried in from the other room. Sorry, but I just don't buy it. I don't get you, I heard Calamity respond. There was something in the tone of both ponies that caught my attention. My ears perked, and I drank quietly as I listened. Your group is like the beginning of a bad joke, Steelhoofs elaborated. A covert agent, a princess descended from pre-war aristocracy, and an outcast from an advanced civilization trot into a saloon and try to tell ponies that they're completely normal. I nearly choked. Swiftly and without a sound, I plugged the canteen and rehung it on the bed. You think we're lying? Thank you, Calamity, for sounding offended. I think either you're lying to me or they're lying to you. I heard a stomp I assumed was from Calamity. What makes you think... Because I was conscious, if barely. I saw all of us down for the count. That alicorn was at full strength, unimpaired, her magical shield shrugging off grenades. Then, a moment later, she was dead. 
The low voice gave a grave accounting of our meeting battle, like a schoolteacher reading test scores. A single bullet hole, right through the brain. You want me to believe some innocent young mare just weeks out of a stable did that? Do you even believe that? I didn't like how quiet Calamity was before saying, Yeah, I do, because that's what happened. An innocent young mare, Steelhoofs repeated, just out of a stable, with refined criminal skills that let her pick every lock and hack every computer, even when no pony else in 200 years has managed the feat. I frowned. I had to admit, I'd wondered about the lack of other skilled pick lockers myself. But then, I also knew that I had honed my skill in precise telekinetic lockpicking over years as part of my attempt to conjure my cutie mark. My CAT proved that my natural talents were focused toward mundane and arcane sciences, and that my studies as a pit buck technician and the tools of my trade gave me the education to manipulate terminals that few outsiders would have. But most of all, I knew that I hadn't been anywhere near as good at either of these things when I left Stable 2 as I had become since. I had been reading books and getting a lot of practice. Steelhoofs continued. For that matter, a stable that is still closed, an operation. It's hard enough to find a stable whose population survived. A dark cloud threatened my mind at that. Calamity's voice was low and perhaps a little dangerous. Are you suggesting they ain't from a stable? No, I'm sure they're from a stable. The voice was cool and even. I just find it more believable that they are highly trained agents on a mission. Perhaps from some place akin to a Ministry of Awesome Black Ops facility than wide-eyed tourists from a repository for civilian ponies. What? I thought Calamity said the Ministry of Awesome didn't actually do anything. Calamity nickered. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Really? Steelhooves asked. She survived a train jumping off a cliff. I called her. Steelhooves paused and seemed to concede on that one. How did you meet her? My friend hesitated, then, with a sad breath, <sighs> I nearly killed her. She'd just come out of Ponyville, where she'd cleared a nest of raiders, Calamity explained. She was covered in blood and wearing armor she'd scavenged from them, so I mistook her for a raider herself, swooped out of the sky, and started shooting. I could hear the regret in his voice. I felt a pang in my heart for him, but I also winced at his description. Even Calamity seemed to do a double take at how that sounded, because after a pause, he quickly followed with, uh, uh, they, they were raiders, mind you. Raiders ain't that hard to kill. Then, seeming to remember the wagon crash, he amended, uh, if you're at least a little lucky, and the terrain is on your side. I see. Steelhoof's deadpan. So she's not a secret agent death pony. She's just lucky. How about the other one? Velvet Remedy? She's... Calamity chuckled. <laughs> she's a civilian. She's a medic and a singer. How does that fit into your cohort ops stable theory? Any other talents does being the most beautiful pony i've ever met count i could hear the smile in calamity's voice <laughs> other than that no i mean well she does have a freakish knack for getting what she wants bartering i mean and talking folks into stuff when she's not being calamity shut up good buck calamity <laughs> Don't finish that sentence. 
a direct descendant of one of the three founders of StableTech. The founder who, I believe, was StableTech's face of public relations, and also the sister of one of the eight most powerful figures in the pre-apocalyptic government. A descendant with skills in seduction, trade, and diplomacy. Steelhooves intoned Riley. No, you're right. That does sound like a civilian pony. I groaned inside. How the hell did Steelhooves manage to do that? I was beginning to doubt my story, <laughs> and I'd lived it. I heard Calamity sigh. I hoped it was out of exasperation. <sighs> okay, let's pretend, just for a minute, that my companions have been lying to me through their teeth. Oh no. Calamity, please don't. We've been honest. I, I know it sounds bad when he says it like that, but... Calamity finished. To what end? Well... The deep masculine voice rumbled. They marched into the center of a battle between raiders and slavers. Somehow got the heads of two factions to sit down in the short one's crosshairs, and then proceeded not only to eliminate the one they didn't like, but to kill the dragon running the show, assuring the one they wanted was in charge. Calamity interrupted. I dare say I had a might to do with that myself. Steelhoofs continued, undissuaded. To me, that sounds a lot like a special unit rearranging local power structures to suit their purposes. Whatever those proposed might be. Goddesses, damn it! Is this what ponies were thinking? A and had I been chagrined by my reputation when I was supposedly just a hero, this... This was insane. At least Calamity seemed to agree with me on that. Right. Okay, then. How about this? If Lil Pip was some sort of special black ops pony, how in tarnation could I have nearly killed her? Because underground training facilities aren't exactly the best place to learn to fight aerial opponents. I doubt you'd be able to get the drop on her again. Calamity was fighting not to fall for it, too. Bless him. Look, I've been with them. Y'all haven't. I know they're surprising, but if you got to know them... I'd see that they're not spies at all. Steelhoof's deep voice seemed on the verge of a chuckle. A yep. Thank you, Calamity. Not a sly, sneaky hair in their manes, then. Not a one. Did you know that when Little Pip sleeps, she has a cute little snore? I do not snore. <gasps> oh, crap! Come again? I was just finishing dressing myself and was levitating my saddlebags into place when the pony in magically powered armor had stepped in and made his announcement. I will be accompanying you to Ten Pony Tower. After risking yourselves to save my life, escorting you safely to your destination is the least I can do. I wasn't sure how I felt about that. Steel Hooves, however, put his hooves down. I insist. I frowned, looking about the room while I thought. The shack had three rooms, the bedroom, the main room, and a workroom in the back. Upon seeing the whole of it, I realized that Steelhooves had given me his own bed to sleep upon, and that every pony had slept on the floors, save for me. It made me feel grateful and guilty. This was not the bedroom I had spent the last several days sick in, but the main room of the shack, featuring a dinner table, rows of metal lockers, a desk with a glowing terminal, and a few scattered trophies as decorations. Above the desk was a banner, a half-apple with an inlay of three magical sparks ringed by gears, held by crescent-shaped wings, 
and overlaid by a sword of war with a mouth brace hilt. It was the same emblem that adorned the flank of Steelhoof's battle armor, right where his cutie mark would be hidden underneath. The Steel Rangers. I sighed. You'll have to ask the others, I said, cinching my saddlebags tight. I started to strap on the holsters and slings for my weapons. I already spoke with them on this. They claimed you're their leader. What? Why? Was I really the... I, I was, was the least qualified to be in charge. <laughs> because the radio kept saying so? I added that to the list of things to talk to DJ Pony about when we arrived at Ten Pony Tower. I looked over to Velvet Remedy, but she was laying on the floor, her mind lost in the Fluttershy memory orb. In the back room, I could hear Calamity working on the weapons he had procured from Stable 29's armory. Our pockets were now filled with common, low-caliber ammo that fit none of the weapons we preferred to use. And Calamity was swapping parts and doing repairs on small pistols and low-powered rifles meant to use those bullets. Not that we expected to use them, only the armory's supply of shotgun shells was likely to be a service to us, but both weapons and ammo would be valuable trade goods. A radio in the back room played DJ Pony's radio station. The sounds of a quartet of ponies gave way to a melody of sorrow, fear, and hope in the vocals of a pleasant-sounding buck who was 200 years dead. I want to calm the storm, but the war is in your eyes. How can I shield you from the horror and the lies? When all that once held meaning is shattered, ruined, bleeding, and the whispers in the darkness tell me we won't survive. Strapping my sniper rifle into place, I finally looked to steel hooves, but my answer faded when I saw he was looking away, his gaze focused on a small picture in the corner of the room that I hadn't noticed before. The picture of an elder orange mare, her yellow mane salted with gray under her cowpony hat. He swayed slightly. I felt a gravity in the room that told me not to speak. I did move forward for a closer look, but I already knew I had seen this mare before. <laughs> Many times. Her statuette was in my saddlebags, as was the memory of her at what had been Pinkie Pie's last party. I was certain now that the memory of steel hooves was in that orb, too. Beneath the picture was a display safe. Inside, perfectly preserved, was yet another statuette of the bucking orange pony. Be strong. In the glory of her youth. On top of the case was a small, silk-lined box, much like the one I had found in Vinyl Scratch's safe, within which sat a single memory orb. Steel Hooves only stirred again when the song ended, the last refrain echoing into nothingness. You knew her, didn't you? I asked softly, gently. Steel Hooves turned toward me. How could I have? She died two centuries ago. I gazed at him, not judging, just knowing. He stood rigid against the gaze for several minutes, until I finally looked away. DJ Pony's voice erupted from the back room. Got your ears up, faithful listeners? Cause I've been talking and some of you ain't been listening. For years now, I've been reminding you that ghouls and zombies ain't the same thing. Ghouls are ponies who have had the misfortune of soaking up a major dose of magical radiation and not dying. That stuff twists and rots their bodies, but unlike zombies, their minds are still like those of any other pony, and they deserve to be treated as such. Well, some of you ponies up in Ten Pony Tower didn't get the message, and when Sheriff Rotting Tail kept pressing him and his ghouls to be allowed inside just because they were sick of being hounded by manacles and slaughtered by bloodwings, 
Chief Grimstar, head of Ted Pony Security, responded by hiring a bunch of mercenaries to scour the tenements along the Celestial Line and wipe them all out. In an interview, when asked how he'd managed to be such a supreme douchebag, Chief Grimstar had this to say. Another voice, gruff and irritated, came through the radio speakers. Fuck off! I did what I was right by those I swore to protect. DJ's pony's voice returned. Just warms the heart to know that there are ponies steadfastly defending prejudice and bigotry, doesn't it? Thank you, Chief Grimstar, and may Celestia bless you with a kiss from the sun. The last certainly sounded like it was said through gritted teeth. I shook my head. On the one hoof, I actually felt relief to hear a news report that wasn't about me. But on the other, I had experience with both ghoul ponies like Ditsy Doo and actual zombie ponies. I knew the difference. And the idea of some pony endorsing wholesale slaughter of innocent ghouls because they couldn't be bothered to discern between them made me hurt. It tinged my vision with red. The deep, masculine voice of Steel Hooves nickered from within his metal helmet. <laughs> Not a fan of ghoul supporters, I take it. I looked at him in confusion that bordered on several darker emotions. My disgust had clearly been evident in either my face or my body language. It hadn't occurred to me that my reaction could easily be misread as directed toward DJ Pony himself. One of the wisest, kindest ponies I've met in this blasted hellscape is a ghoul pony! I spat at him. Her name is Ditsy Doo, and she's easily worth any three Steel Rangers put together. Not for fighting skills or fancy weapons, but for the quality of her character. I stomped a forehoof hard enough to sprain it. DJ Pony is right. And if you don't get that, then you have no place traveling with us. Steelhoof said nothing, but began to pack. I gazed at the leftover parts strewn across the workbench in Calamity's wake. Now that I had all the parts to build my poison dart gun, I should use this opportunity to put it together. Invoking my single magical ability, I started to clear away a space while simultaneously pulling the schematics out of my saddlebags. Morning, little pip, Calamity trotted into the room. <laughs> it's good to see you back on your hooves. I smiled a little thinly, giving him a nod. The conversation from the night before still cast its shadow in my mind. I knew what Calamity and the Steel Ranger had talked about, and just how convincingly Steel Hooves had woven doubts. Calamity knew I'd been eavesdropping, but neither of us had said anything. Looks like we got ourselves a new traveling companion. <laughs> At least for a little while, Calamity said conversationally. What you think of him? I shrugged. I still wasn't sure what to make of the Steel Ranger. I'd seen the shadows of both good and bad in him, but it was too soon to do anything more than to hop, skip, and jump to conclusions. From Calamity's cautious tone, I could tell he was having doubts about Steel Hooves. I'll admit, we could use the firepower, he offered graciously. Be damned useful having an explosive ordnance specialist like that in the saddle if we run into any more of them alicorns. I nodded, having begun to worry about the next time we encountered those creatures. If my suspicions were right. On the other hoof, Calamity started to say, then stopped as if questioning whether his opinion was worth voicing. I turned to look at him and lifted a hoof and a wave for him to go on. Well, let's just say that the Steel Rangers ain't exactly got a reputation as champions of the common pony. <sighs> ah, yes, reputations. The night's conversation loomed in my mind again. My eyes looked over Calamity, taking in the distance between us. I wondered if the gap was more than just physical. 
my memories pulled back the sheet on an almost forgotten dream of being trapped under a wall and watching my friends just walk away. Uh, hey, Lil Pill, are you okay? Clearly, I bore my worries like a cutie mark. I snorted at the dark humor of it. <laughs> Some secret spy I'd be. Calamity clopped up next to me and put a hoof gently over my back. Now, don't you worry. Nothing said by that lot's going to sow seeds of distrust between us. I looked up at him, wide-eyed. He smiled at me. <laughs> I've seen your heart, little pip. Y'all genuinely want to help folk, and you put your own life at risk to do so, even when some of them don't deserve it. I ain't going to start questioning what I know about you just because some pony who don't know what he's yapping about can get it all twisted up. I could feel tears gathering in my eyes. I taut my forelegs around the big rust-colored pony and hugged him for all I was worth. You can look into it if you want. It was the first thing Steelhoofs had said to me since my outburst over an hour ago. Velvet Remedy was in the room, looking over our provisions. Calamity was refilling our canteens from Steelhoofs water purifier. I had finished my packing and had been staring aimlessly. My curious gaze had eventually fallen on the memory orb, sitting enthroned under the picture of Applejack, mayor of the Ministry of... I realized I didn't really know my, which of Ministry of Luna's government Applejack had been in charge of. I just had enough clues to make a few educated guesses. Go ahead, Steelhoofs encouraged. It hasn't been viewed in a long, long time. Some pony else should remember. I regarded first the Steel Ranger, then the Orb. I had to wonder why any pony other than a unicorn would be keeping one, since only unicorns could access the memory stored within. It made no sense, I realized, unless that pony was keeping it so it could be shared, or safekeeping it. But even safekeeping it was just the same as throwing it away if no pony ever witnessed what was kept inside. I nodded, respectful of what I was being offered. Then leaned forward, pointing my horn towards the sphere and touching it with my magic. My world fell away. I was harnessed to something. We were standing off stage, concealed in darkness by a heavy curtain. Applejack stood next to me, staring out at the stone, dark stage. The podium with microphone and speakers, the mumbling throng filling the auditorium in front of it, the huge brass MWT logo on the wall behind it. I, or at least the pony whose memory I was riding, only had eyes for her. She looked nervous, not to mention uncomfortable in her formal business dress. I can't do this. I felt myself speak, heard the words coming from my mouth. You'll be fine. The voice was deep and strong, like steel hooves, but not nearly so gravelly. They hate me. Half of them already been saddle sore because I started pulling all my hooves into the ministry instead of just letting them do what they wanted. But bringing in Twilight's ponies? From her tone, that had apparently not gone over well at all. I wrapped a foreleg around her neck, allowing me to glimpse the apple green color of my coat and nuzzled her gently, a sensation that I found quite pleasant. And after today, they'll all understand it, and they'll admire you for it. I, or more precisely, the pony I was riding, leaned close and whispered into her ear, Now, go on out there and make history, or I'll be forced to spank you. Oh, Goddess Celestia! The orange pony blushed and gave her encourager a look that I would have paid almost anything to have a mare give me. Hmm. Later, lover boy. She smiled, at least more cheerful now, and strode out before the crowd. 
The pony I was riding watched her stride, his eyes straying repeatedly to her franks, taking my gaze with his. As much as I couldn't blame him, it was making me feel distinctly uncomfortable. This was an odd memory to be sharing. Then I noticed she had a holster strapped to one leg, mostly hidden beneath her formal attire. The ivory handle flashed three red apples as she walked. The reception was not the respectful and admiring silence which Fluttershy received, but Applejack stood up straight at the podium, cleared her throat, and spoke slowly and clearly. <clears throat> now, listen up. I know y'all been a bit sore about having ponies from the Ministry of Arcane Sciences working with us. I know y'all are dedicated to improving Equestria the Earth Pony way, and magic kind of flies in the face of all of that. But there are some things that are just too important to let stubborn pride get in the way of asking for help. Trust me, I know. And I want all y'all to know how proud I am to be standing here today, finally able to show you the fruits of your efforts. Most of you don't know what you've been working on. It was important to keep things... The next word did not seem to come naturally to her. Compartmentalized to keep this project out of zebra hooves. What y'all have accomplished in just one year ain't been a bunch of earth ponies do more good work in less time than when we built Appaloosa. Until this point, her words were undercut by resentful rumbles of whispered opinion. Now, her voice dropped into a tone both somber and deadly serious. The ponies in the audience began to hush. Not for her, but out of what a reverence she spoke for. When I was young, my big brother, Big Macintosh, was always there for me. He was my closest kin, and he never let me down. And when Equestria needed him, he didn't let us down neither. He served heroically in our army, fighting for our way of life for three years. And then when we needed him the most, he, he made the ultimate sacrifice. When that zebra bullet punched through my brother's armor and pierced his heart, it broke my heart too. I could see Applejack's eyes start to tear. Her voice trembled, but she pressed on. The room was now dead silent, except for her. One year ago, we buried my brother, Big Macintosh. And that day, I swore an oath that no one other pony would die needlessly in battle. They're risking our lives they're risking their lives out there for us. We owe them better. And now, starting today, we give them better. My memory escort started walking onto the stage. I felt the ropes trailing from me lift and pull taut, the harness digging into my flesh. I felt the resistance and heard the wheels of the wagon I was pulling begin to move. Ponies of the Ministry of Technology. I give to y'all the Steel Ranger. Moments later, the memory collapsed, the last sight lingering in my mind as my world asserted itself. A glance back at the display wagon and the magical power armor it was carrying. I looked to Steel Hooves, sensing I now understood him far more than I had moments ago. The light gray of the clouds had descended, shrouding the landscape in fog. All around us, the rubble of blast-flattened and age-demolished buildings created shadows and obstacles. I regularly had to check my EFS compass to make sure we were still headed in the right direction. Even Calamity was grounded to avoid losing us. We were entering the outskirts of Manhattan now. I felt a pang of disappointment that I couldn't properly see the city. Calamity and Velvet Remedy had taken the lead. 
My frequent attention to my eyes forward sparkle was as much to spot the hostile creatures as to navigate. Another red spot flared up in front of us and just off to the lead. Calamity, seven o'clock. Calamity nodded and crouched down, sneaking forward. The fog wrapped around him, concealing him from my vision, but my EFS compass marked his position. Velvet hung back a little, but kept him locked in her sight, her horn glowing faintly as she prepared to throw a shield around the orange main pegasus in the black desperado hat. A moment later, a single twin shot rang out. Calamity returned. John Radhog. One of the mutated pig-like creatures I had encountered under the train bridge. I do hope you're not planning to cook and eat that. Velvet Remedy intoned disparagingly. I can't imagine all the meat you've been eating did you any good over the last few days. I shot her a look that she probably couldn't see and said nothing. You see, now that's why y'all are a vegetarian, Calamity laughed. <laughs> you ain't never had bacon. Trust me, if ponies were meant to eat only fruits, oats, and grasses, and the existence of bacon would be proof in the pile that the world was just cruel and evil. Oh, great. Now I had to try eating rad hog. A few moments later, we had a cook fire started, and Calamity was explaining to me just which parts of a rad hog were the most delicious. Velvet Remedy had chosen to join Steel Hooves in ignoring the two of us. Her silky voice sliced through the air as she told Steel Hooves, now, if we get into a battle, I do hope you have the good sense to let Calamity and Little Pip handle it. N no offense, I really am thankful for your coming to our rescue, but I came closer to dying from all your explosions than from the alicorns. I hadn't thought of it that way, but Velvet Remedy had a strong point. Steelhoof's weapons were all extremely, uh, excessive. And while that was very good for fighting manacores or alicorns at a good distance, it could be lethal to every pony in close quarters or in close spaces. I'd have to convince Steelhoofs to keep himself in reserve until he was needed. I wasn't sure how that would go over with the Steel Ranger. Traveling with others and having to take precautions to keep his own companions alive was not, I suspected, something Steel Hooves had been required to deal with for a long time. Old song, Calamity was saying to Velvet Remedy as the two of them took the lead once again. If I sang a little bit of it, badly probably, could you magic up some music to go with it? Well, Velvet said uncertainly, I could certainly try. Then, with a reassuring smile, And your voice is quite good. If you took some singing lessons, you'd be very pleasant to listen to. I rolled my eyes. That's my velvet. No, that's Calamity's velvet, I reasserted to myself. <laughs> and then wiped the whole thought clean. Velvet Remedy was velvet's velvet, and would be until she said otherwise. And even then, only so long as she allowed it, Calamity was going to be Velvet's Calamity. And I... I was not going to be a jealous third wing. Steelhooves was bringing up the rear. I dropped back, choosing to engage him in discourse rather than dwell on the two ponies in front of me. Trying to strike up conversation, I told him I had a question about the memory I'd seen. What question? His voice suggested there were a great many questions he suspected I might have, and that most of them were not really my business. The Ministry of Technology. Why MWT? When the unseen pony spoke, I could hear a touch of relief in his voice. Officially, it was the Ministry of Wartime Technologies. But Applejack hated that name. She was always the first to point out that the technological innovations that MWT championed and subsidized benefited all of Equestria, not just the war effort. I nodded, in listening intently. 
It was a subject that Steelhoof had some warmth for. But a small flash of green in the sky above us distracted my gaze. I looked up, but saw nothing. I turned to ask Steelhoof if he'd seen anything, but he was continuing to speak about Applejack's ministry. I doubted a sky wagon crash could have diverted his attention. Under the ministry's guidance and support, dozens of innovative technology industries blossomed across Equestria, and existing ones became a lot more powerful, their products becoming part of every pony's daily life. Companies like Ironshod, Four Stars, Equestrian Robotics, and even Stable Tech. He turned his helmeted gaze down toward my pit buck. So why use a name focused on war? It should have been the Ministry of Technology. I heard music. Not Velvet Remedy or Calamity. Patriotic gala music whispering out of the mist. I stopped, turning in place until the little blip of light appeared on my compass. Uh, every pony, please hold up. I, I want to check on something. Alone? Steelhoof's question. Yes. I nodded. It's okay. I'll be right back. She do this a lot? I heard him ask my companions as I slipped off into the mist, following the sound. <laughs> to what? Calamity snickered. <laughs> Wander off? Break travel to explore random ruins? <laughs> All the time. I was approaching a building. Half of it was a huge barn with vast shattered windows. The other half loomed castle-like in the midst. My pip-buck flashed a name across my EFS, Four Stars Grand Terminal and Central Offices. The music cut out with a static-laced pop. Hello, Watcher. Hello, little pip. I see you've made a new friend. Maybe? I said, not committing either way. As if on cue... Steelhoof's deep voice resonated through the mist. Little Pip, you okay? Wow. Stealthy he was not. Hey, the mechanical voice the Watcher expressed. That voice sounds familiar. That didn't surprise me. Steelhoof's voice was very distinctive. And if Watcher had been snooping on the equestrian wasteland for any length of time... It may very well have spied on the Steel Rangers. Watcher. <laughs> now there was a pony who deserved to be suspected as a covert op spy pony. I looked around for the Sprite bot, but the fog concealed it expertly. Instead, I spotted twin vending machines, Sparkle Cola and Sunsi Sunrise Sarsaparilla, and a third set of just a few yards down from them, Ironshod's Ammo Emporium. The last had been torn open and thoroughly looted. I felt a chill, imagining the kind of pre-war world where you could buy ammo along with your soft drinks at street-side machine. No pony interaction necessary. Watcher, was there a Ministry of Awesome? It was just a lead-in question. Clearly, I already knew. Ah, yes, Rainbow Dash. The disembodied artificial voice somehow managed to sound amused, even though it had no inflection at all. Yes. One of Equestria's heroes did decide that her ministry would be the Ministry of Awesome. They even built a ministry headquarters for it on Ministry Walk. I assume Calamity mentioned it? I nodded. Then realizing Watcher possibly couldn't see me any better than I could see the Sprite Bot, although it would truly surprise me if that was the case. I stated, Yes. Ministry Walk. Hmm. I'd heard of that place before, but I couldn't quite put my hoof on where or when. After pondering it fruitlessly, I finally asked, What did the Ministry of Awesome do? I hated, loathed, questioning something Calamity had told me, especially based on something Steelhoofs had said. Even more so after Calamity had not done the same. Not much, Watcher said to my great sense of relief. I mean, Rainbow Dash did throw two or three projects their way. 
The Single Pony Project was one of theirs, for example. But for the most part, they just lounged around and did nothing. After a few years, Luna ordered it crated up, and they began using the MAU headquarters for storage. Another question came to me. I activated my Pipbuck's inventory arrangement spell and opened my saddlebags, then stopped checking to make sure. Uh, can you see me? Yes, little Pip, I can see you. Thought so. I floated out the two statuettes I had found. What are these? Of course, Watcher knew the answer. Limited edition Ponies of Harmony. Those are some pretty nice little magical artifacts you have there. Only 42 were ever made. 42? I was expecting closer to six. Equestrians heroines, the six pony friends whose virtues match the elements of harmony. There were seven sets made, one for each of them and one that Luna kept for herself. The ponies mostly gave them to each other, although a few of the statuettes were passed on to loved ones or family members. That made sense. Sweetie Belle had her sisters. Applejack would have given one of herself to her buck friend Apple Snack. I wondered if the one I found in Old Appaloosa had originally been a gift for Brayburn. Oh! Now I remember who your new friend sounds like. The name Watcher told me made me glad I wasn't drinking Sparkle Cola again. Who was... I never got to finish my question. A crack of static replaced Watcher with the voice of Red Eye, who was in the middle of telling everyone that raiders, ghouls, and hellhounds were bad. His voice faded as the sprite bot wandered aimlessly away from me until it was swallowed entirely by the mist. Four Stars was an elevated train company which had once provided public transportation for the Manhattan metropolis. Steel Hoof suggested that, if the monorails were still intact, it would make the easiest route through the city, carrying us over the maze of rubble and away from most of the radiation-twisted aberrations and occasional raiders that lurked in the ruins. It sounded like a good plan, so I stopped at a still-illuminated sign mapping out the rails. This station was part of the Luna Line. The Celestia Line, which it crossed at several points, led straight to Ten Pony Tower. Calamity finished rummaging through the garbage bins, returning with a surprising collection of sellable items and a few dozen bottle caps. Velvet Remedy rolled her eyes. <laughs> well... I hope that's enough for you to buy a bath once we get to Ten Pony. I looked across the waiting station toward the heavy doors into the more castle-like office structure. There were blackened panels that looked like turret emplacements which had been destroyed ages ago. Curiously, I trotted over to the door and tried it. Locked. Well, that was just begging for me to open it. What are you doing? Steel Hooves asked as he joined the others with him. I want to see what's inside, I said simply, focusing on the lock. Mm, this was a hard one. Four Stars did not want to give us its secrets easily, which only made me all the more intent on learning what those secrets were. I heard Calamity make a snicker that clearly translated to, told you so. The lock clicked. Triumphantly, I swung the door open. In an eye blink, I registered the expanse of the gray lobby, its semicircular desk fortified with sandbags and makeshift barricades. In that glimpse, I saw the scattered bodies of a dozen steel rangers, suits of magical power armor holding skeletal pony remains. And I saw the three scorched holes in the ceiling which had once held turrets. The remaining turret on the Four Stars lobby ceiling swung around and opened fire. I was taken by surprise, but Velvet Remedy had been prepared. Her shield burst around me, even as the air was filled with the rat -tat 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 of machine gun fire. However, the shield gave no protection. The bullets ripped right through it, then through my armor and through me. My body tore apart in agony. Dozens of things going horribly wrong inside all at once, as at least six shots passed clean through me and buried themselves in the station's floor tiles. 
I barely heard the explosive roar of Steelhoof's grenade machine gun as I collapsed, sound and light fleeting from me. It was as if I was falling down a well. Through the distant ring above, I could see the ceiling detonate in a mass of fireballs, then come raining down with a distant thunder collapsing into the lobby below. I returned to the wasteland of the living, alert and in pain. Velvet Remedy was pouring another extra strength restoration potion down my throat. I choked, gasping. Welcome back, little pit. We came very close to losing you. What, what happened? Calamity's voice called out from somewhere further into the rubble. Armor piercing bullets! His voice sounded disbelieving and alarmed. Stop! ordered Steel Hooves. I panicked, wondering what I was doing that I could stop, but his exclamation was directed toward Calamity. I will not let you loot the bodies of fallen rangers. Hey! Calamity shot back. In case you didn't notice, they ain't using this stuff anymore. And the ammo that ridiculous battle saddle of yours throws around ain't cheap. And ain't the sort of stuff you find in raiders' ammo boxes or the desk drawers or office buildings. We need to scavenge it from wherever we can, whenever we can. Calamity quieted a moment and trotted into view with a missile in his mouth. Trust me, I ain't wishing it. He spat out the missile into a pile he was collecting, shooting a glower at steel hooves. I looked to Velvet Remedy, who was prodding me to drink more. Right. Uh, from now on, sneak in the buildings that might not be friendly. Steelhoofs made his way back to me. I wondered how covert, super death pony-like I looked to him now. With my armor full of holes and covered in my own sticky blood, I would need to have it cleaned and mended when I got to Ten Pony Tower. Or maybe sooner. I was guessing I didn't look much better than I had coming out of Ponyville. You definitely got my attention, he said and turned toward the nearest dead ranger. Now I want to know more about this building, too. I nodded. Okay, let's split up. I considered keeping Velvet Remedy at my side, but realized it wasn't the best play. Steel hooves with me. Velvet, would you mind staying with Calamity? The two of you look into the rest of this floor in the basement. We'll check out the offices upstairs. Velvet smiled and then fixed me with a harsh stare. Be careful. A lot more careful than this was. I promised. Attention all Four Stars employees. In conjunction with new safety and security protocols, all employees will be issued a standard military class firearm. This firearm is to be worn at all times when on company property. Failure to do so, or failure to keep your firearm well maintained and properly loaded, will be grounds for termination under Employee Uniform Policy 13B. In the unlikely event of incursion onto Four Stars private property by government forces, all employees are required to defend Four Stars proprietary property and executive personnel. All employees are therefore required to attend at least one of the three four-star defense and teamwork building weekend training programs this month. Failure to do so will be grounds for termination under Employee Attendance Policy 6F. Daisy May will be providing some of her lovely home-baked flour cookies for refreshments after the FSDTB exercises. Yum! I'd read that same message before. It was on each terminal I'd hacked into. It didn't make any more sense to me now than the first time. I looked over to Steel Hooves, checking to make sure everything was alright before I clicked the next one. I figured out now was as good a time as any to ask. Steel Hooves? Have you ever heard of someone named Flutter Guy? Steel Hooves whinnied. <laughs> Why do you ask? Oh, I 
I heard some pony say your voice sounded like Flutter Guy. Steelhooves gave a little stomp. Heard that before. My ears perked. I figured it was a long shot at best that Steelhooves would have knowledge about the pony Watcher had mentioned. I opened my muzzle to ask, but he silenced me. It's just a joke. Oh. <laughs> so much for insight. I turned back to the terminal messages. Evacuation policy, employee version. We here at Four Stars value your commitment to the company. In the extremely unlikely event of a federal raid, or worse, a mega spell attack, it is every employee's duty to bodyguard key personnel and ensure the safe evacuation of all employees in the following order. 1. President of Four Stars and any shareholders on property. 2. Members of executive management. 3. Head researchers. 4. The President's Secretary, Daisy May. 5. Members of mid-level management. 6. Research assistants with red, black, or gold level clearance. 7. Research assistants with orange or white level clearance. 8. Floor supervisors. Once all of the above have been safely evacuated from the property, we encourage you to seek your own safety. To ensure your protection, we are issuing military-class armor-piercing ammo to all employees above the supervisor level. I sat back from the terminal and promised myself that if ever I was somehow hurled back in time, I would never go to work here. There had been a surprising amount of still-functioning arcana technology in this building. Or at least there had been. Steel Hooves was not subtle, and every time he took out one of the security brain bots or spider-like guard bots, he did massive damage to everything nearby. Scavenging had been reduced to finding things inside metal desks or looting boxes of ammo. Fortunately, there were quite a few of each. Nobody had safely broken into this place in centuries, and the sheer number of ammo boxes alone could have supported a small army. Calamity had been right. Not one of the boxes included missiles or grenade ammo, but we had enough of just about everything else, including a lot of armor-piercing rounds, to last a good long time, with no extra to sell. The prevalence of armor-piercing ammo had steel hooves convinced this place had been fortifying specifically against the Steel Rangers. But there was one more, and this one seemed a private message, not duplicated on any other terminal yet. Re Sutton, I hear the Ministry of Morale got her. Charges of sedition. MOM agents broke into her house in the middle of the night last weekend and hauled her away. Management is throwing fits on the floor above me. They seem sure Sutton will say something, or worse, Remember something. All I know is I'm expecting armored ministry goons to buck the doors in any day now. Fuck these apple seed shooters. I'm going to start bringing my gun from home. Steel hooves turned away, protecting my flank as I snuck forward. I split my attention between the hall and my EFS compass as I scouted ahead, checking rooms, digging into desks, and looking through bookshelves, until another splash of red lit up on my compass. Backtracking, I pointed steel hooves in the direction of the next hostel. Then I lingered back in a side room, not wanting to be caught in the backwash that accompanied any attack he made in a narrow hallway. A robotic voice crawled out. This is private property, federal pigs. Surrender and be annihilated. It was immediately followed by the whoosh of a rocket. The hallway erupted in flame. To my surprise, I heard steel hooves hit the floor. Luna shitting moon rocks! That was from the security robot! What kind of robot fires missiles? I pulled out my sniper rifle, loading armor-piercing bullets into it. Then... Crouching low, I took a peek around the corner. 
The robot took up most of the hull and looked like the mutant child of a steel ranger in a tank. Its four legs ended in treaded balls that propelled it slowly down the corridor. I counted at least three weapons, including a missile launcher turret and a minigun set into a swiveling chest mount that could rotate 180 degrees around the robot's frame. And my mind searched for an appropriate level of profanity, but came up blank as a newborn's flank. The thing was rolling toward steel hooves, who was moving, but down. The chest minigun swung toward the fallen ranger. I was quite certain that it had armor-piercing ammo of its own. Leaping around the corner, I swung the sniper rifle and stared down its scope. That minigun stopped pointing toward steel hooves and began to turn toward me as I slid into Sat's targeting Nirvana. The sniper rifle roared off three shots in quick succession. The first two bullets punched small holes in the head of the tank-like Sentinel, seeming to only slightly impair its targeting. The Sentinel's minigun tore up the wall, a single bullet tearing into my armor for a deeply grazing hit across my left flank. My third shot struck into the missile turret, which promptly exploded. The rockets had been designed to take out a steel ranger. They were just as effective in rendering the steel Sentinel inert. My left hind leg feeling wobbly, fresh blood mixing in with the matted, sticky mess of my coat. I hobbled over to Steel Hooves. His armor was administering healing potions and bolstering drugs. The armor self-repair spell was consuming scrap metal from an armored compartment over his right flank, rebuilding itself. I stopped a moment to marvel at what Applejack and her ministry had created. Will you be okay? I asked. Steelhoofs nodded, stalwartly not moaning. No. Then I'll be right back. I want to know what that monster was guarding. The Sentinel robot had been guarding the office suite of the president of Four Stars. The desk was armored, designed for use as a barricade, and there was a hidden panel in the wall. Well, it would have been hidden if it had been closed. The desk was locked. Picking it cost me a bobby pin and netted me what looked like a security pass card. I nickered at the irony, suspecting the card would have let us freely pass by all the robotic security we had to fight through to get here. Several locked boxes of ammo were hidden under the desk. As I opened the first, I found half a dozen Matrix disruption grenades. I knew immediately that they were designed to disrupt the spell matrixes of steel ranger armor, rendering them helpless, just as the Alicorn's tack had done steel hooves. But I couldn't help thinking how such grenades would also disrupt the more mundane technologies of most robots, including the one guarding this room. Magical shotgun of dragon slaying in the dryer's chamber, indeed. It took me several tries to hack into the computer, each time backing out before I could recognize the intrusion and lock me out completely. Evaluation Policy, Executive Version When Manhattan suffers a mega spell event, or worse, if the Ministry of Morale stages a raid on this property, all executive officers of four stars are to proceed to the basement stable in according with evacuation procedures ZS-1A-5D, listed below. Please keep to your assigned routes. The four star stable is guaranteed to keep you safely protected in the event of either catastrophe and has food, water, and medical supplies to outlast even a complete megaspell event. Nearly 12 whole weeks worth. The FSS also includes an armory, firing range to keep in practice, and plenty of reading material to keep you occupied. These include instruction manuals on how to acclimate yourself to the new exterior environment once after effects of megaspell detonations have subsided, and proper etiquette for greeting our ruling zebra benefactors. Okie dokie, Loki. St 
Steel Rangers were not Ministry of Morale. Some pony had called in the big guns, and worse, the ponies in charge had been expecting it. What were they doing? According to the attached map, the hidden stairs would lead us right down to the basement. We should be able to meet up with Calamity and Velvet Remedy swiftly from there. I began picking the lock on the weapons cabinet. Like the terminal, it pushed the limits of my skills. I was tempted to use one of my party-time mintals to give me that extra edge, but just before I gave up and did so, the cabinet opened. Inside was an armored dress unlike any I'd seen before. Red and black with golden trimmed, perfectly preserved. I pulled it out and draped it over my back, thinking Velvet Remedy would look stunning in it. The armor also came with a helmet, but I was tempted to leave it. The flourish of red feathers almost screamed target. Also inside were several assault carbines of a peculiar and impressive design. One of them was scoped and fitted with a silencer. It had a custom wood-carved handle stained with stripes of white and black. Been waiting for you, little pip, Calamity smiled at me as I joined him in the basement. He and Velvet Remedy stood before a door sealed with a terminal. Looking at the terminal, I was pleased to discover that if it had a magic eye for scanning pass cards, damn thing would be useful after all. I offered Velvet Remedy the outfit I had found. She shunned the helmet as garish, but soon had Calamity helping her into the armored dress. I found my attention turned to the terminal, floating up the pass guard. Where in the hell did you find that? Steelhoof's voice boomed as he finally caught up with us. I turned to look at him as I telekinetically held the pass guard in place. Steelhoof's had stopped at the bottom of the stairs and was staring at Velvet Remedy. Little Pit found it in a locker upstairs. Velvet Remedy answered, prancing. <laughs> How do you think it looks on me? Beautiful, answered Clamity with a breath. The red and gold matches the streaks in your mane and tail. Then, with a sheepish grin, and I've never seen anything like it, which means no pony will mistake you for a raider or slaver and accidentally shoot you. The terminal's magic eye looked over the mask card and bleeped happily. Welcome, Mrs. President. Inner mechanics began to hiss and grind as the door began to open. This wasn't anything as sophisticated as a stable tech door, but it was certainly a few grades above anything I'd seen in the wasteland. I might shoot her. Steelhoofs grumbled. We all shot him perplexed and nasty looks. That, he explained, is a zebra legionnaire's uniform. Calamity whistled. Velvet Remedy suddenly looked uncomfortable. I turned away, choosing to look instead into the darkness of the open mini-stable in front of me. Gleaming in the darkness, the eyes of at least a dozen zombie ponies stared back at me. Then I did a double take. Zombies, yes, but not ponies. Footnote, level up. New perk, Action Philly, level one. You know you're targeting spell like the back of your hoof, making you about 20% cooler in combat. For each level of this perk, you gain plus 15 action points in sats. <laughs>